Another one of my favorite quantum health friends is Miley Costa. So Miley specializes in weight loss, blood sugar, digestive health. So we go into a lot of that, especially gut health, but she's also a runner, an adventure runner. So I talked to her a little bit about that and really the quantum perspective of healing and recovery. If you are an athlete or you're an adventure runner or just a regular runner, so you might really like that, especially around these things like hormone, weight loss, digestive health. So I hope you enjoy listening to this episode with Miley as much as I enjoyed talking with Miley. Miley, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on. Thank oh, you for thank taking the time. So yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I, I, you are somebody that I've become quite fond of in the quantum biology collective. I just feel like a lot of, especially your posts sometimes I think, oh, that's so relatable to my story or my thinking. So I love that. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. I, sometimes you wonder like, is anyone actually seeing what I'm putting out there? I know. Well, you know, yeah. people are seeing yours. You've got quite the following, but I know things have shifted for you. And so yes. you, I want to talk about your running because I just think running in general is, you know, one thing, but your adventure runner and how you got into that and, and, but really how you came to quantum too, like, how did that, when did sure. that happen? Um, well, I, I can tell you how I came into quantum first and then I'll, I can tell you about the running. Um, yeah. but I, I've dealt with gut health issues pretty much my entire life for as long as I can remember I've had problems you know way back seeing the pediatrician and him putting me on a white foods diet so white oh. rice and white <laughs> bread and pasta and right needless to say it did not help um but I've kind of you know I've gone through periods of having more extreme issues with my gut health and then um periods where it's been a little bit more manageable, but about a year and a half ago, I was in the middle of a flare that was pretty debilitating at times. And I've studied nutrition and I've tried different things with my diet over the past, I don't know, 20 years. And a lot of those diet changes did wonders for me. I mean, I'd have these long periods of, I guess you could even call it remission where I just, I felt fairly normal. <laughs> um, but this flare that I was in, the diet wasn't helping it. I went to even carnivore, which had done really great things for me previously and it, it wasn't helping. And so I was feeling desperate. My thyroid was totally out of whack. And, um, I've seen all the doctors, the naturopaths, the, you know, every, every kind of practitioner you can think of every protocol and cleanse and treatment and nothing was working. And so I just started searching and I came across Sarah Kleiner. Yeah. And it, it seems, seems like a lot of people <laughs> find Sarah and that's sort of their foray into quantum and circadian health, but that's what it was for me. And I started taking some of her courses and listening to all of her podcasts. And, um, eventually that led me to Carrie Bennett and, and yeah. thing, taking her courses and I joined her community and I was learning so much. And then eventually that led me to the certification program. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's how, I mean, usually it's this personal, you know, and there's a desperation in the personal quest and lots of us have already studied so many things that we're like, well, I must be missing a piece. So it sounds like that for you when things exactly. this flare up that happened, you know, that last flare up, do you mind telling me like what the digestive health stuff, a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, and it, it's kind of changed over my life. When I was a kid, I would have, I mean, the most excruciating pain just kind of all throughout my gut where I, I was doubled over. I remember being really little and finding a focal point on the wall and just having to focus and breathe. And, and I would pray that I wasn't going to die. It was so, so bad. Wow. As I've gotten older, there's not as much pain, but it would, it was in chronic diarrhea and okay. just, you know, no matter what I would get to the point where I could eat all plants or I could eat all meat or I could eliminate fat or I, it, did, it didn't really matter. <laughs> it's like anything that went into my mouth was causing a major problem. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was stuck there for 
it was over a year that it was wow. that way. Okay. It sort of became my, my norm. So, yeah. Well, I appreciate you pointing that out. Cause I don't think when people, especially I didn't even think pain, like what you had when you were little, that, mm-hmm. that doubling over in pain. I don't think that's what I was thinking with gut digestive issues. I think I was thinking more of the constipation, diarrhea, the stuff that we typically right. floating, the IBS, that irritable system, but, but that pain too, that must've been really hard as a little person because it's confusing why your body's doing that. And right. Yeah. yeah. And as getting into my teens, I started being afraid to eat, especially okay. going over to someone's house. I remember being at a friend's house and yeah. sort of pushing the food around on my plate. And my friend's dad said, oh, are you afraid to eat? And it was sort of this light bulb that went off. Cause I, I hadn't recognized the fear of eating, but when he said it, I went, yeah, I am. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what you cook with what's in your food. And right. It was scary. And so knowing what you know about quantum health and all the, the, so at some point something works, can you pinpoint what things in particular, I mean, you're wearing your blue blockers. We do all the things. Once we start down the quantum road, we start doing all the things and changing our lifestyle. Can you pinpoint the things that were most helpful in turning that ship around for you? Yeah. I mean, I do think it was a combination of things. I know, I mean, diet is a very, very big part of this puzzle for me. So I have stayed kind of in the keto, sometimes carnivore realm, although I've changed it to be much more seasonal. I I used to just kind of stick to the same thing all year round. And um, it is helpful for me to pay attention to the seasonality of the foods that I'm eating. So that was a big part of it, but it was really when I started waking up and seeing sunrise. And (laughs) that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do because along with my gut issues, I've also been a night a, a lifelong night owl. Uh-huh. And so I just thought, you know, I'm hearing Sarah talk about waking up for sunrise. I don't know if I can do that, but I'm willing to try. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, I would say within four to five days of getting up for sunrise, being out for UVA, and then I started in the winter. So once UVB appeared again, being out in UVB, that's when I started noting significant changes. So it was, it was pretty quick. And it was, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was dramatic. It was a dramatic change. Which you really appreciate because when it's not noticeable, it can be difficult to keep going. But I think what's hard for people is that disease, a disease state took a process. And so the healing is also a process and the healing actually includes symptoms So that can be really confusing for people. We were talking about that before we started recording too. It's like when you're on a healing journey, you, it's, it can be a little discouraging when something comes up and you're like, I don't want to, I think I'm healing, but we look at it completely differently when, now that we understand quantum health is that the body has actually moved, already moved into a healing state when we experience these kind of eruptions of what we would call symptoms. Right. So. And, and actually it wasn't just at this smooth process where, Oh, I <laughs> see the sunrise and UVA and I put my blue blockers on and, you know, all is fine and dandy. I have had some ups and downs, but it has never gone back to the way that it was before. So yeah. it's, it's encouraging. Yeah. I know I'm on the right path. Everything keeps improving and anything that I layer on, at mm-hmm. this point seems to work better than it ever has before. So right. diet, homeopathy, mm-hmm. um, u- utilizing red light on my belly, going out and exposing my belly to UVB when it's available, like those things, they just, yeah, they work yeah, better. Everything works better. That's, uh, I totally agree with that. And I do think you, st- you just feel like you're on the right path finally, because you continue to see that even when, when you have the downs, of something coming up. It's never bad. Like it, whatever you were experiencing before, it's not like that. Yes. It's, it's, it's not it. debilitating. I can go on with my life. It might be a little uncomfortable. Yeah. And it's, it's usually very, it's, it's a short amount of time. It's like these short little setbacks and then make a few adjustments and then kind of get back on track again. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. What has been, so the, what's been the most challenging of through the journey, I guess, for you, what has been the most, well, the sunrise was at first, right? Or the sunrise other- was, yeah, that was really, ch- in fact, I, I asked Carrie on one of her live calls, I said, am I ever going to just like want to jump out of bed full of energy, super excited for the day? Okay. That's she good to like, yeah. Honestly, you might not. And, and that was sort of no, really, because I was so excited to be a morning person. And um, I said, okay, but that's all right. You know, there's so many benefits that I'm experiencing. If I am not, you know, the the first one jumping out of bed to start my day full of excitement, that's that's okay. Like that's, yeah, I can, I can live with that. But eight months into the journey, I woke up one morning without my alarm. I was excited. I had nothing planned for the day. And yet I was still like, oh God, I, I'm excited. I'm excited to get up. I can't lay here anymore. So. I'm so glad you brought that up because that was my experience. And I too had done all the stuff with diet. I was a nutritional therapist. I have the background in clinical mental health and then had gone to nutritional therapy school and was doing all this stuff. And I thought I'd healed about as much as you can. I didn't realize that you really actually can wake up feeling that energized and it's kind of amazing. It, it And the excitement, it's almost like I haven't had coffee in years, but I, what I imagine people get really attached to their coffee because it gives them that pep, but it also gives you the, the jitters and the other issues. Yeah. And it's almost yeah. like a hyper. This is more like a, a, a grounded, clear, energized, but really the excitement is probably the word that you used excitement, I think is probably the best word for that. Feeling. Yeah. And it, it's the coffee thing is that I haven't had coffee, at least not caffeinated coffee in years either, mm-hmm. but I felt like that excitement I would get from the coffee. It was, I mean, obviously it's external. It's something that you're mm-hmm. taking from the outside and putting in, this is coming from the inside yeah. out right. and it's such a different feeling. Right. Well, since we're talking about food too, you had a post about gluten that I really, I have had, I have not had gluten in over 10 years because I just Mm -hmm. realized that it was really a problem for me. I mainly get really irritable. So like just Mm -hmm. angry, irritable, not so much the digestive stuff, just my whole system seems to be just upset by it. And then I, a few years ago decided to make some pumpkin bread or like something. And I had my hands all in the flour and I started having heart palpitations and I started feeling absolutely awful. And I thought there's no way this is from just touching the flour being around the flour, but you had a similar with two things that I thought were important about learning that you really can't do gluten and the way you learned it. But then also the things that our brain can tell us sometimes about, oh, it can't be that bad. It's probably not. I should, you know, it's the holidays. I could have little like that stuff. So I think maybe just start with your experience with gluten and how you realized that's not something you can do. Sure. Um, well, I had played around with cutting out gluten kind of because, you know, it's it was a trendy thing to do in health and <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no gluten. And I felt really good not eating gluten. Um, I had also experienced some anxiety after having my second, my daughter, my second child, uh, which I later realized had a lot to do with my thyroid, <laughs> but uh-huh. I decided to take gluten out of my diet really to help the anxiety. And it did tremendously. Uh, uh, yes. So yeah. it went out. Um, and then, you know, mixed in with my gut issues and things. I had tried carnivore at one point for 30 days and had amazing results with my gut. And I noticed I was able to start eating foods that I hadn't eaten for a while. And so I thought I must be healed. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to try eating gluten. And it was around Christmas and a friend of mine had sent, um, this amazing pecan pie, pecan, pecan, we have a little argument (laughs) about how to pronounce it. Um, so it came from Texas from this restaurant. I guess it's famous for its pies. And I thought, you know what? I'm just, I'm feeling good. I'm healed. I'm going to try some of the pie. And it was amazing. And I actually felt fine. I didn't have any digestive upset. I felt pretty good. And so I thought, all right, 
look at me. I mean, I'm not too <laughs> like this is this is pretty awesome. So I I ate my fair share of that pie, and then a neighbor brought over cupcakes the next day, and I tried the cupcakes, and then um, I went to a movie, and I remember sitting in the movie, and I started having this really weird, almost like an electrical current running through my body. It was a really strange and very awful <laughs> feeling. My heart started pounding, and this is probably, I'd say five hours after eating that cupcake. So I'm sitting there and I'm shaking like I've had 10 cups of coffee. My heart's racing. I'm sweating. And I'm with my friend. <laughs> Gosh, I can't, I don't know what's going on. I'm sitting here calmly watching a movie. Why, why am I having a panic attack? It took a couple hours and it sort of subsided. I did not make the connection because I, there had been so many hours between eating the cupcake, eating the pie, sitting in the movie. So the next day I had something else. I don't know. It went on for a week, maybe two of eating little things. And um, I finally made the connection because it the, the time between eating the gluten and these symptoms started getting shorter and shorter. And it got to the point where I was having tingling in my hands. I couldn't feel parts of my arm. My vision in one of my eyes was getting blurry. My heart was constantly pounding. It wasn't subsiding. And I started thinking, okay, I'm in my forties. What if I'm having a heart attack? I'm like, what is going on? Even though I kind of in the back of my mind, I was like, okay, I know there's, there's some connection here with the gluten, but these are pretty severe symptoms. This, this is not the digestive stuff. This isn't just a little anxiety. Yeah. So I went to urgent care and they're like, you need to go straight to the ER. So I go to the ER thinking, they're just going to tell me you're having anxiety, go home, rest, whatever. And he says, I'm going to admit you, we need to rule out a stroke. <laughs> a stroke? So I was actually in the hospital for four days, not feeling any better, having every test under the sun, and they couldn't figure it out. Though during that time, I, I went, this is gluten. It has to be. Like, there's nothing else that has changed in my life, I'm not stressed. I'm there's just no reason to be feeling this way. The tests are coming back fine. So I mentioned it to a doctor and he kind of oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe. So it took a month for me to start feeling normal again. Uh -huh. And after that, I was like, nope, <laughs> we are done. Right. And what I thought was important too is that in order to get a celiac panel. I mean, well, you can get one, but in order to get accurate results, you actually have to keep eating the gluten to see yeah. if that's it or not. Because I, at some point later, went to a practitioner who said, well, let's just see if you have celiac. I took the panel and it said it was negative. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, see, it wasn't that. So I guess, you know, I'm just sensitive to it or whatever not realizing that I hadn't had it in so many years that it's not going to be accurate. And my exactly. practitioner was a functional medicine practitioner that still didn't, didn't get that either. You yeah. Know? And it was actually my kid's pediatrician who told me that I couldn't be tested. Um, we have an integrative practice, which I absolutely adore, but I was telling her about what had happened. And she said, well, we can't test you because you'd have to be eating gluten every day for at least six weeks, six to eight weeks. She's like, we're not going to do that to you. So we can assume you're celiac or, you know, assume that you're just right. highly intolerant. Right. So, and either way, it doesn't matter. But I think these symptoms, yeah. a lot of time people, I get this all the time because I mainly work with people that are stressed and anxious and they do not connect. So sometimes it's sugar, caffeine, gluten these are the three big things that when people will actually cut them out they don't experience the the anxiety and there's this right. common thread of it all seems normal when you're stressed like mm -hmm. if you have stress in your life you assume that is what it is and you just keep moving on when you are not actually you're like i don't have a lot of stress in my life i really don't feel stressed then it starts to connect. Oh, my food is probably part of what's happening. I mean, is the part of the mood that I've just not connected. Right. And that's, I would try and explain, because my husband would say, well, what are you anxious about? And I said, I'm not anxious about 
anything. I, I feel physical symptoms of anxiety. Right. So it, I feel like it's, it's coming from something that's going into my body or yes. that's surrounding my body, but it's not, I'm not worrying about anything. I'm not stressed about anything. So it was, it was a little bit tricky yeah. <laughs> to come to that realization and then also to explain it to other people. Right. And that, yeah, the really, I mean, it's difficult to explain any of this stuff to, to people, but the fact that you're so in tune with your body, just guessing that you are, have been that way. I'm guessing that the running and being so connected to your body is helpful in detecting these things. Yeah, I, I think I have probably always been pretty in tune. The running definitely brought that to a whole, a whole other level. And I, I actually, so for running, I started running because I was feeling anxious and, um, I just wanted to lose pregnancy weight. It was after my second baby mm-hmm. and my friend had signed up for a, a 10K and I went, oh my gosh, a 10K? Like, how far is that? How can you do that? You run the whole time. <laughs> okay. So, so you didn't I, grow up a runner loving running. No, <laughs> I actually grew up, um, dancing ballet very seriously from seven till 18. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, that is, I would call ballet a sport, but yes, yes, not a sport, not, but not running, yeah. not Dep- running. Mm-hmm. In fact, when I told my friends I was taking up running, they were like, what <laughs> you dance, you don't do sports. Um, I so I signed like- up for a well, with the thyroid, I'm just, you're also, mm-hmm. after the second baby, you also are showing signs of thyroid, which could have actually been gluten. Um, but mm-hmm. I mean, like there are all these pieces to the puzzle. You're a night owl. You've had a yeah. second child, like all the things. So right. running seems like a real good idea. <laughs> right. To- and I mean, the main focus for me with the running was the anxiety and the weight, weight loss. and mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so I, I signed up for a 5k trained for it. I think uh-huh. I did couch to 5k and ran that with my husband thought I was going to die. I didn't think I was ever going to get to the finish line. But when I crossed the finish line, that feeling was like nothing I had ever experienced before. It was magical. And I knew I wanted to do more. And I kind of thought that I would, I'd get to half marathon and that would be it. In fact, I told people I will never run more than a half marathon. And I was so proud of myself. I joined a running group and I showed up the first day and I was like, I ran a half marathon. And they're like, oh, cool. Yeah, that's nice. I'm like, yeah, it's, that's really far. Right. <laughs> they're like, oh yeah. Yeah. We're signed up for a 50 mile. <laughs> yeah. 50 miles. What? But eventually I did go into marathons and then, and I was, I was very, I was really interested in getting faster and I was feeling relief from anxiety and I had lost some of my, my post-pregnancy weight. And, um, but it was, it was really just, it was about the running. It was about getting faster. It was about training and that was really fun. But then one of my friends from the running group said that he was going to train for a hundred mile, which was just, mind-boggling to me I didn't know yeah, people it seems did that completely insane to me but yeah okay <laughs> you know, and it did to me so as training he did a 50 mile run and I went and I crewed for him so you, you if you're lucky enough to get people to volunteer to help you you right. create a crew and they're there at all the aid stations and they take care of you and people will jump in and, and pace you or be a safety runner and I thought wow this is really cool this is not about speed. This is about community and pushing yeah. yourself to a place that you never thought you could go to. And it was just so intriguing. Yeah. So he then went and did his hundred mile and I went and I paced him 30 miles. It was the first time I'd ever done anything that long. And the race that he did is, um, it's in Arizona. It's called the Havelina hundred and it's a loop race. It's 20, 20 mile loops. I thought you're so crazy. You're going to go to the desert and run around in circles. <laughs> But it was the most amazing experience I had ever had. These people were supportive. You've got elite runners and um, recreational runners, all ages, sizes, abilities, and everyone wants everyone to succeed. And people were there helping each other. And you're, you're running these loops, these 20 mile loops, and you switch directions every, every time you finish the loop. And so 
eventually you're you're passing by people and and it's customary to wave or say something positive or encouraging and I just thought this is so cool and even though it was in my race I just I felt so excited again and invigorated and I'm like I'm gonna do this so yeah I just I started training for ultras and it was life-changing but it also definitely gets you in tune with your body you know you 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 go through, it feels almost like you're living an entire lifetime in a single race because those races can be anywhere from, you know, five hours to over 30 hours. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. I never really thought about the community piece, Miley, until you just said that I could feel what you were saying, like people, you know, along the way, having the people, the community part of it, I could feel that coming off of you. And I've never thought about that part before. It always just seems like that's really bad on your adrenals. That's going to stress your right. body out. That's, and I have, you know, lots of clients that with their anxiety, the exercise and extreme exercise has been really helpful for their anxiety. And it helps them also become more and more tolerant of sensations in their body. Mm -hmm. Because when you've had a traumatic background, if you have childhood trauma or different traumas that happen, what can happen, you know, in the nervous system, those places that get stuck. And so we just get stuck energetically. Yeah. And this can be something that it will scare you to have sensations. Or if you've grown up with digestive problems, and if you start to feel any kind of digestive anything, it can bring on fear, right. which is alerts the whole nervous system so that the actual training and healing through exercise has helped them become more and more tolerant of whatever sensations might they They know they're not going to die from these sensations, that this is right. information that they're going to be okay. And you can push your body, but this is not something that I'm like really wanting people to do because of adrenals. So tell me, yes, what do you think about that part of it? The, you know, well, that is something I have thought a lot about because I mean, once you get into hundred mile races, I don't do two hundreds, but people are doing 200 mile races. This is hard on your body, but I know people, one person in particular, he he's run I and mean, he, he'll run 10 hundred milers with two hundreds in there every single year. He runs every single day, at least two miles. Even if he's run a 200 mile, <laughs> finished a 200 miler the day before he gets up the next day and he runs two miles and he's a very healthy individual. And I'm just thinking, how, how does, how does his how does the system handle this? And I mean, I know it's not this way for everyone because my body would not be able to handle that kind of running, but I think at least with trail and with trail ultras there, there is a different component to it. There's something, I mean, a, a lot of the people that you'll talk to who run ultras, they will all say that they do it for the moving meditation. Um, many people are recovering or recovered addicts, people who have experienced trauma and you're not running super fast the whole time. So it's not like this constant adrenaline endorphin rush. A lot of it is walking and just moving slowly through these things. Then there's the community part. You, again, if you're lucky enough to have a group of people who will volunteer to drive around all these aid stations and help you for days on end, you have this group that's there for you and they're willing to do anything for you. And while you're going through your journey of, you know, extreme highs and extreme lows, I mean, I've, I've definitely had moments where I have sat down in the middle of a trail and started bawling my eyes out, swearing like a sailor and, you know, sitting like a toddler and refusing to go with my pacer standing there being super patient and encouraging and saying, okay, but you know, you are going to have to get up at some point. <laughs> right? Okay, fine, I'll go. <laughs> you go through all of these different emotions and you come out, whether you finished or not. I mean, I have, I have DNF'd, not finished, um, several races, but you still come out knowing that you survived something that was really, really hard. And I mean, there's people who do 200 milers and they hallucinate. I mean, they're having some pretty crazy experiences 
but I, for me, there's been moments where it, it, it's almost felt spiritual. I mean, there's just something that you can't yeah. really wrap your head around, quantify. I don't know how to explain it, but it's, yeah, it's really powerful. So right. it's, and then you, but then you think about the physical body and I, I know that I'm putting this enormous amount of strain on my nervous system and my adrenals. And, um, it's a lot of runners don't recover long enough or maybe properly. And I definitely didn't. And it, it definitely taxed my, <laughs> my adrenals. Right. And we can get into that. I just love the picture that you're painting of this being so therapeutic. And then I was just, it just occurred to me when you're talking, the things that I try to get people to do over the years to feel their feelings and feel all you're in this concentrated time where you can feel all different things. <laughs> and well, and you're not judged for it. Right. Like I, I remember standing, I was debating whether or not to drop out of a race that I had trained really hard for. It was the middle of the night. I was having some pretty intense, it felt like urinary tract, um, infection pain type Burning. thing. Uh -huh, yeah. Burning. And so I'm standing there in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, crying, trying to call somebody. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And these two women walked by total strangers. I had no idea who they were. And one of them came over to me and she said, do you need a hug? And I'm, I'm bawling my eyes out. I was like, yeah, I do. And this stranger gave me the most warm, heartfelt hug I think I've ever had. And then, then she just, she left and I made my decision. I dropped and it, you know, it just, but it was this really amazing kind of magical moment. I don't know who she was. I will never see her again in my life, mm -hmm. but it was, it was really special. And, and you, you meet people and have these really deep conversations. You have emotions come up, you tell them personal things that you would never tell someone that you just met five minutes ago. There was one woman walking in front of me on the trail. We talked for an hour and we were talking about our kids and our past and all these things. And I have no idea what her face looked like. <laughs> we, we didn't exchange names. I don't know who she was, but she knows some pretty personal things about me. I, I, that's really interesting. And I think it's really beautiful. I didn't, I just didn't think about the spiritual parts of that either. I really like the idea of the trail running like yeah. that. It seems trickier, slower, more mentally challenging, not just like I have to finish this, but like, you've really got to pay attention to your twist, break, fall. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you're, I, I imagine it might be different for the people trying to win the races. I'm, oh, right. I'm not that person. Yeah. <laughs> So even during a race, I'll stop and I look at a view or I touch a tree or sit down on a rock and just kind of take in what I'm, what I am seeing and experiencing. It's you, you get to go to such beautiful places on foot during these races that I, that I probably wouldn't go to on my own, but having a marked course and aid stations and people who are somewhat close by, it makes me feel safe and you just, you, I don't know, you just get to experience such amazing things. Yeah. So it's hard then, to, yeah, it's hard to quantify, to put it into words out of our normal realm experience. And so to, if you haven't experienced it, but it's, you paint a beautiful picture of it. It's almost, I'm like, mm, I wonder if I could do this, but I do think that restoring your body, if you are, I mean, there, you can have those kinds of experiences doing other things. I'm sure I've heard some of this too. Absolutely you know, different podcast guests about travel and, you mm -hmm. know, doing these really adventure travel where you don't, you you actually don't tell anybody your name and your profession and all the things that you would, I mean, their net, your name, you probably do, but all the stuff about you and you just have this totally different experience. So having right. different experiences, having community, having these people that are encouraging and kind, and you may or may not ever see them again. All of that sounds right. great. And then to restore your body, um, because it is a stress on the body, but so is cold right. therapy. So is, you know, fasting and all the other things that we can utilize. So to me, it sounds like it's also about learning how to restore. Right. And that, that is something that I see lacking within this community because you kind of, well, for me, and I know this happens to other, other runners, but 
get started. It's so exciting. The experience is you know, just so incredible that you want to, there's a website called Ultra Sign Up it has all the ultras. So <laughs> you have to be a little cautious with Ultra Sign Up because you want to sign up for all the races and do all the things. And I definitely got caught up in that. I, I over raced and over trained and I, I took over three years of really not running very much because I just couldn't my I think my body was like okay you, you didn't do the recovery <laughs> you didn't take the time and I didn't have all of these supportive things in my life that I now have the sunlight and even the extra tools the cold the red light the sauna like I, I wasn't incorporating all the of those things of stuff. Yeah. And so now, stuff. are you helping is that kind of where your work is moving you in a direction of coaching people in this way? Or where do you think? Um, I mean, uh, I have had several runners as clients and I think it's helpful for them that I understand the running part, <laughs> um, the running part, because some of the people who I've talked to about the issues, you know, my chronic health issues, well, they're, they're saying, well, you know, but the, the running is really stressful. And I said, yeah, I know, I know. But there's this whole other side of it that I just, it's so important. And I don't feel like I can completely give that up. So when I'm working with runners, I'm like, I get it. I totally get it. You want to be out there. It does something that you can't explain. But we really, really need that support on either end. And so right. I, I, I don't I don't know if that's exactly where my coaching will go. I think runners are a little hesitant. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So far what I've experienced because. You just sort of want to do what you want to do, but um, I, I I would like to work with runners, but yeah. it seems to be I'm getting people who have digestive issues and um, people who are interested in utilizing a ketogenic or even carnivore approach to their diet. Like those are the kind of people that that reach out with some runners scattered in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you know. You never know because th these techniques, the strategies that we have, both the nutrition and the quantum health strategies really work for everybody. <laughs> they're, mm -hmm. they're foundational. So exactly. whatever we've got going on, whether it's thyroid, you know, so I have clients, uh, most of my clientele at the beginning when I switched into nutritional therapy were people with gut health issues. And I really thought I had it figured out with nutrition and then realized there's this whole piece that we were missing. Exactly. It's about harmonizing with our natural environment. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I started learning more about mitochondrial health, then you're like, we really need to be paying attention to the seasons. So yeah, yes. carnivore is awesome, especially if it's in the winter because right. that's when it would normally work really well for us. So yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm finding that too, especially this winter, because I'm more focused on the seasons um, during the summer, I was going to the farmer's market and eating the strawberries and, you know, other produce that I can tolerate. And once we started rolling into fall, I started noticing I'm not tolerating things as well. The carbs, uh, my blood sugar started going up. We have, and then the day is getting shorter. So mm -hmm. I'm inside, even though I've changed out light bulbs and where the blue blockers, there's still blue light that I'm exposed to. And seeing a lot of issues with blood sugar regulation. And so for me, having to go much closer to carnivore during the winter seems to be really important. Yeah. But um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that as UVB <laughs> appears again and the farmer's market opens, that I will probably be able to tolerate a lot more carbohydrate in my diet than, than I am right now. Yep. Same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's always really exciting when I, we do tolerate more things, but I also have to be cautious like you. I mean, yeah, that could be a delayed response. Yes. <laughs> You're like, wait, what? And that's a tricky to, one. <laughs> it's tricky because it's hard to connect what it is. And we don't want to be afraid of eating. Like that is right. really important. The food is important to our, our health, our, you know, our vitality. Right. So we don't want to be afraid of it. And, and that has been an interesting journey. Sounds like it's been an interesting journey for you too. It has. I mean, definitely the not being afraid of food for the gut health issues, but also I, I grew up dancing ballet I and mean, you're standing uh, for hours in front of a mirror surrounded by all these other 
people <laughs> looking at your body and trying to fit into costumes and being sent mixed signals about body image. So yeah, if I, I, I wish that I had known then what I know now, because fueling your body to be able to do these things is so important. And, and understanding that that fuel is not just from food, that it, it is from nature. It's from sunlight. It's from touching the ground, touching, touching nature. Mm -hmm. That right. fuels us too. So yeah. Right. Getting those electrons. Yep. <laughs> As I really, you know, realized how much everything relates to mitochondrial health, like really at the end of the day. And I think yeah. that's why, I don't know if you agree or disagree or have a thought about this, but I think that's why the ketogenic diet is, yes, it's helping us to split the switch from glucose burner to ketone burner or fat burner. And that, that flexibility can be really important, but also you're increasing your fat intake and fat is full of electrons. Hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, yes, yes. <laughs> also just be earthing and doing it in other ways. But I think that's part of why that is so healing for people. I agree. Definitely. As opposed to uh, the way I used to think about it is that it was more about metabolic health and it is, but it's also helping your mitochondria. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, Learning more about mitochondria, realizing that <laughs> that's the foundation, like all these other things that we're doing, we're, we're helping build that strong foundation or we're doing things that are weakening that foundation. Yeah. But um, yeah, I was really kind of focused on all the stuff up here and yeah. now I'm focusing more down here. Right. And those things are important, but this yeah. is. Really and they do have you know, they will, you will have some relief. You can have some improvement in your health from the things up That's here. Right. And so, yeah. you know, it's like, but we still got to go deeper and really work in the foundation. So it's an exciting, right. it's an exciting place to be. It really, it really is. It's, it's nice when things start clicking. Like, oh, okay that piece of the puzzle that I've been missing all these years, here it is. And it's actually pretty simple things. Simple. I mean, the science can be complicated. I mean, at least for me in the beginning, it was like, okay, whoa. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> this is a lot, but um, putting it into practice is, is really pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, I often have been talking, especially lately about how we change and what cre creates transformation is to take a step. So to commit and take a step. And I feel like that's with the quantum health practices. It was really just about, you know, like sunrise is good for you. Okay. All right. If you, if that yeah. resonates with you, just do it, whether you believe it or you don't believe it, or you think right. it will work or not, just commit and then take a step and be consistent with it. And that. And if you do that, then you start to see, and I guess you could see if something, if you committed to something and you were trying something and it didn't work, you could see that too, but commit and yeah. take a step. I think, I think that's the huge part, the commitment and then the consistency, right. because I know for me, I was kind of caught up in trying to find the next new thing and okay, this didn't work right away. So now I need to move on to this and then to this and then to this. And there was no consistency. Yeah. The sunlight, well, I mean, I was with diet, but um, the yeah. sunlight was one of the first things that I committed to and I was really, really consistent with. Mm -hmm. And thankfully I saw benefits within the first few days, but it just keeps improving over, over the long term. Right. Pretty cool. <laughs> it is really cool. I just heard as somebody say the other night that everybody wants transformation, but nobody wants to change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's so true. Uh, yeah, I've been there. I mean, me too. Like, I was right. like, live outside? No, no, thank you. I don't want to do that. But then you crave it. You start to, I really crave the sunlight. So I do too. I do too. And I was just, I was actually just saying um, to another person who was in our, in our program, I realized not too long ago that I had missed over 16,000 sunrises in my life. Wow. 16,000 sunrises. <laughs> like I never want to miss one ever again, because 
I love it so much. It feels so good. And it's not just in the moment. It, it carries out through the day. It's better sleep. It's waking up the next day. It's just, it's, it's magical. Mm -hmm. It makes the day. And you know that if you started with sunrise, you've already won. Like whatever happens yeah, exactly. the, rest of the day, I've already won the day. Because I, <laughs> I do think it's important just in case people are popping in for like, they haven't heard this before. It doesn't have to be sunny and you don't actually right. have to the sunrise to be benefiting from the light you can just pop outside trees yeah. building whatever's in the way cloud snow whatever it is yeah you're still getting I mean it's, it's pretty awesome I see I've seen some of your sunrises that you post on Instagram I'm like oh that's yeah. amazing yeah. I'm in the mountains and so I have a house right in, in front of me and trees all around but it doesn't matter you still get the light Mm, I do like the mountains too, but yeah, my, my sunrises, we got very, I just got really lucky <laughs> and I didn't even buy, I didn't move here for that. It just worked out that way, but I, yeah, I will scale you know, like uh, buildings, the parking lot things when I'm traveling to get to the top of like a parking garage so I can see some light. Yeah. Yeah. You do what you can yeah. do. It's worth it. You just once you start feeling good, feels you realize you feel so good to feel good. I think we've been, for me, again, for me, so conditioned to accept feeling less than optimal as being normal. And so, yeah, once you start committing and doing some things consistently and you start feeling good, you're like, wow, okay, no, this is normal. <laughs> this is normal. I this know. is where I want to be. Right. And then you want to tell everybody else. Yeah. yeah. So for is, I really loved everything we've talked about. Is there anything else? Is there something that we missed that you really wanted to share? Is there something that we didn't talk about that's nourishing to your body, mind, soul? I think those are, those are the main things. And those are the things that I'm really focused on mm -hmm. moving forward. So no, I, th I think we covered everything. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. And I'm even, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to think I might enjoy some running possibly maybe, especially now that I have the quantum health strategies to restore right. my body. It sounds like it might actually be oh, sorry. something really interesting to, well, think. I would love to run with you if we're ever in the same place, <laughs> we can go for my style run, which is very gentle. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, the years are long, so I don't know, but yeah, I, I'll put that in my bucket list and we will, we'll see if we can make that happen at some point. My, my current running is a lot more hiking with running sprinkled in. So. Okay. That I can do. I can do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're not sprinting up hills, not sprinting up mountains. <laughs> and I can come out West to do that. I think I can, yeah. I can do that. Yeah. I'm putting it in my, in my list of to do's. Awesome one day. So thank you, Miley. I really love talking to you. I appreciate thank you so much. <laughs>